Thanks, Corey. So I, I guess as Corey said, he saved the best for last, not so much that uh, I'm saying uh, I am the best speaker in the last group, but I think this is the most exciting session that you're going to hear about today, mostly because I think the greatest advances we've had in therapies maybe in the last 10 years have really happened in the last year with a lot of the immunologically based therapies. So I have no disclosures. So I'll skip over the objectives today. You can see those on your slides. Um, so the main uh, overall concept here is just to get a basic understanding of the tumor microenvironment and the immunologic system and how they interface with one another so that you have a sense of where the subsequent speakers are going to be as they present their data. So how does it that we even begin in this position in the first place? So what, what is it uh, about immunosurveillance and where are the, where's the data or where's the suggestion that the immune system has an impact in malignancy? Well, if you look at patients that are HIV positive, right, have significant derangement in their immune system, mostly through a CD4-mediated mechanism, these patients are at higher risk for virally mediated cancers. So there's some immune surveillance component there that's lost. We do know over many decades now, actually, that many tumor-associated antigens are actually have been associated, but um, there's been really minimal activity in the immune system against cancers. Organ transplant recipients, which are mostly uh, suppressed from a T cell perspective, are at higher risk of developing lung cancer. And lastly, the perineoplastic syndromes that we see in lung cancer, such as the anti-HU and anti-SOX antibodies, um, these patients uh, tend to have a better prognosis. They have sometimes devastating neurologic consequences, but may have a better prognosis long term, which is actually interesting, and I'll show some of this data later, that you know, this is an antibody-mediated um, process that happens in these patients. So it may not all be T cells. There may be some B cell component and humoral component here as well. So this is what we're dealing with. This is a general overview of the tumor microenvironment, which is incredibly complex. So if you look on the right of this image, this is the normal lung, and if you look on the left, this is the tumor bed. And most of the immunologic activity is actually happening in that interface between the normal lung and the tumor bed. And this is where there's been these new structures called tertiary lymphoid structures that have kind of been identified. You know, the primary lymphoid structures being spleen and so on, and the secondary being the lymph nodes. But it's been noticed that at this interface between the lung and the tumor, there are these lymphoid structures that develop. And within this, there's an incredibly complex environment. So there's T cells, B cells, mature and immature dendritic cells, macrophages, NK cells, plasma cells, all of them are at this interface speaking or with one another and potentially with the tumor such that uh, there may or may not be a response that's happening there. So this is just immunohistochemistry that's showing the actual uh, component of what's in that image. So the panel A at the top left is the tumor. The bottom right of panel A, where you see the black circle, that's actually a lymphoid follicle that's at the interface between the tumor and the normal tissue. Panel B is basically showing in one of those lymphoid follicles, either are dendritic cells, they're the red cells that are speckled throughout there. Panel C is showing B cells that are present within this lymphoid follicle. If you high power on that and go to panel D, the blue cells you see within the B cells are actually T cells. Panel E is dendritic cells that are present in this location, and panel F is macrophages. So within these tertiary lymphoid structures at the interface of the tumor, we basically have almost all the components of the immune system there that are trying to speak with one another, that are trying to figure out what's going on with the tumor. So this is kind of how the immunologic interface uh, has to happen in order to get an immune response against the tumor. So starting at panel one, the tumor actually has to release antigens. And then panel two, there's dendritic cells that have to pick up those antigens and take them to um, a lymphoid structure of some kind to present that antigen to the T cells, uh, such as there's priming and activation. Once they're activated, they have to get out of that lymphoid structure, back into the circulation or back in through the stroma, if it's at the tertiary lymphoid structure, into the tumor itself. Once they're in the tumor, they have to infiltrate the tumor. And then once they're there, they have to recognize the tumor as presented by MHC molecules. And lastly, they have to kill the tumor. So all of these steps are incredibly complex. And you can see within there, the green in each one of these boxes are positive regulators, and the black are negative regulators. So at each one of these steps, there are a profound number of positive and negative regulators that may impact the ability of the immune system to do its job. So these now I'm going to go through some of the characteristics of these various cell types that are present within the tumors that have been shown to uh, impact survival. So this is one of the earliest studies. They took lung cancer um, 
dissected them and then, I'm sorry, uh, took paraffin sections and basically stained them for just tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. And what they found is that in the Kaplan-Meier curves, those tumors that had high levels of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes had better survival than those that were, had limited infiltration with tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. This particular is looking at um, dendritic cells and T cells. So again, they took paraffin embedded uh, tumors, they sectioned them and stained for dendritic cells and CD8 cells. Panel A is basically just looking at dendritic cells alone. The red being those, patients, those tumors that had high levels of dendritic cells, the blue line being um, low levels of dendritic cells. Panel B is looking at the CD8 cells in the tumor alone. So they differentiated whether the CD8 cells were in the tumor or whether in the stroma. And basically they demonstrated that whether it was B or C, being in tumor or stroma, um, higher levels of CD8 cells that were present in either tumor or stroma had higher survival. And then if you combine those and dendritic cells with the T cells, uh, those that had high, both high dendritic cells and high T cells, whether it was in tumor or stroma, had much better survival than those that um, did not have, that had low levels of dendritic cells and T cells, whether they be in the stroma or in the tumor itself. How about macrophages? So this is looking at tumor macrophages, and they uh, compared that with CD8 cells, where they were present either in the nests within the tumor itself, or whether those cells were located in the stroma of the tumor. The thought being that if they're in the tumor, uh, they may be having more uh, activity and improve survival and outcomes than if they're just sitting in the stroma being inactive. So in the Kaplan-Meier curve, the, the best survival with the solid black line on the right, that's when there's high levels of macrophages and high levels of T, of T cells that are present in the tumor. And the worst outcome are those that had high levels of macrophages and high levels of T cells in the stroma. And so where these cells reside also makes a difference. How about B cells? So this is now looking at uh, B cells and dendritic cells. And so panels C, E, and G are in early stage lung cancers. D, F, and H are in late stage lung cancers. Trying to get a sense as to whether the position of these cells, where they were located in the numbers, made a difference whether it was early or late stage. So C and D, whether it's early or late stage, those are dendritic cells. So high levels of dendritic cells had better survival than those that had low levels of dendritic cells. I'm sorry, I have that backwards. That was C and D are B cells. So when there are high levels of B cells in the tumor, again, better survival than low levels of B cells. E and F basically confirms what I had shown you in the prior study, that when there's high levels of dendritic cells um, in the tumor, whether it's early stage or late stage, they had better survival. And then when you combine them, high levels of dendritic cells and high levels of B cells, whether it's early stage or late stage, they do better with a better survival than if there's low levels of, of B cells and dendritic cells in the tumor. So lastly, it's not only the um, positive cells. So theoretically, we think the macrophages, the B cells, the T cells, and dendritic cells, these are all generating positive immunologic responses in the tumors. How about the negative regulatory cells? So T regulatory cells, these are the FOXP3 CTLA4 positive cells that can reside in tumors. And what they did here, looking at overall survival and relapse-free survival, those patients that had high levels of T regulatory cells present in their tumors had much worse survival than those that had low levels of T regulatory cells. So the negative regulators can also impact outcome and survival. So basically what does all this mean or show is that this interface is an incredibly complex environment between the tumor um, and the immunologic system. And it's not just T cells, which is often what's been thought to be the case. I think it's the entire immunologic system that has an impact here. So it's dendritic cells, it's T cells, B cells, macrophages, and how they communicate with one another and how the tumor communicates with them that makes a difference in uh, responses and, in and patient survival. So the real question is, how do we enhance the endogenous cells that are there and or modify those regulatory pathways that may be suppressing the endogenous cells that are there so that we can enhance the responses? And that's what we'll see in these subsequent studies that are gonna be reviewed going forward. But one of the pathways, um, I'm not gonna review the study specifically, but just review these pathways is the immune checkpoints. So the main immune checkpoint that we all know has been studied is PDL1, I'm sorry, PD1 and PDL1. But there's also negative regulatory, CTLA4, which uh, has been discussed here as well. One that's being investigated preclinically and has been shown to potentially may even be as important, if not more important, PD1, and I think we'll hear a lot more of coming forward, is the T cell immunoglobulin and, and mucin domain three or TIM3. And basically these immune checkpoint inhibitors are either on the surface of the antigen presenting cells or on the surface of the tumor cell that modify T cell function. So this is just 
kind of, a, I'm going to narrow down with the red boxes to the ones in which we have um, inhibitors right now. So the top red box is looking at PDUL1. Uh, the bottom box is looking at CTL4. So if we look at antigen presenting cells being the, the, on your left on the screen, these cognate receptors on the antigen presenting cell are PDL1 or um, CD80 or CD86. When they bind to the T cell cognate receptor, which for PDL1 is PD1, or CTLA4 for CD80, CD6, this shuts down the T cell um, and prevents the antigen presenting cell from creating an active T cell. If I just switch out this, um, pretend that the antigen presenting cell is the tumor, so the left side is the tumor, um, remove CTLA4 and CD80, CD6 because that's not on the tumor, but the PDL1 phenomena is the same here. So the tumor has uh, the PDL1 uh, on its uh, surface, which binds to the PD1 on the T cell and basically shuts it down. But recognize, too, that at least at the level of the antigen presenting cell, there are many other regulators here which are not currently under investigation and uh, probably will be going forward that may impact the ability of the immune system to be enhanced. So how about PD-1, just very briefly? So this has been shown to be expressed anywhere in 20 to 60 percent of tumor cells, uh, and it depends on the tumor type. It might be more frequent in squamous cell. Uh, it has been shown that if there's high levels of expression, uh, their patients may have a worse prognosis. Similarly, PD-1 expression on T cells has been shown to result in imp impaired T cell function. That's how the, the negative regulatory pathway works and can ultimately lead to T cell exhaustion. And lastly, in a very elegant study that was uh, done in science about a year, year and a half ago, it was demonstrated that uh, patients that had a higher tumor uh, mutation burden and higher levels of neoantigen um, present in their tumor may actually predict a better response to PD-1, probably because these higher mutation burdens and uh, neoantigen pre present in the tumor is creating more active or more T cells that are, I should say, primed in the tumor microenvironment that are being inhibited that when you give them PD-1 in inhibition, those T cells can then become active. So very briefly, this is just reiterating the top right on your screen is at the interface of the antigen presenting cell and the uh, T cell itself in the tertiary or maybe in the secondary lymphoid uh, organ where the CTLA-4 binds to CD8 or CD86 and basically turns off the T cell from uh, activity. And at the bottom with the square is the level of the tumor where the uh, T cell engages the um, major histopath MHC complex and uh, via the T cell receptor, but when the PD-1 binds to the PD-L1 present on the tumor, it prevents the T cell from becoming active. So what must happen for our uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors to be able to work? Well, the T cells must express the inhibiting receptor, and the tumor microenvironment must also express that ligand. If either one of these are at high or low levels, the inhibitors may actually not work. And importantly, the T cells not only have to be present at the interface with the tumor to become active, and they have to be active against the tumor itself. So they have to be primed, yet suppressed from activity, such that when you add the inhibitor in place, the T cell then becomes uh, active. So if you can envision theoretically, how would PD-1 inhibitors work best? So the top row is basically showing that within the tumor itself, there's a strong endogenous anti-tumor immune response, but it's kind of being shut off because via the next box, PD-L1 inhibition is high. So if you add the PD-1 inhibitor, that basically takes the brakes off. Those prime T cells that are being inhibited uh, become active and you get a response. PD-1 inhibitors are probably not going to work well in an environment where there's a very weak endogenous uh, tumor, anti-tumor immune response and or the tumor is not expressing uh, a lot of PD-L1 inhibitor or PDL1, such that inhibition of either a weak response where T cells are not really primed to become active or no PDL1 expression on the tumor itself, the inhibitor is not going to activate those T cells. And it's certainly not going to lead to increased infiltration of the T cells into the tumor. Lastly, if we think to the next step, how can we alter that environment? Well, one way we may be able to alter that environment is if there isn't a weak endogenous anti tumor immune response, if we can somehow boost that by creating neoantigens, uh, by giving a gene therapy adenovirus, something to stimulate and increase the amount of antigens that may result in T cell presentation and more T cells in the tumor, even though they may be uh, weak, we've now increased that number, you add the inhibitor, and by adding the inhibitor, you can then enhance the response. 
So just remember that while immune checkpoint inhibitors have really been the focus of uh, the advances in immunotherapy, there are many other immunotherapeutic uh, options that are being investigated, including adoptive cellular immunotherapy, which usually is ex vivo modification of the T cells uh, and readministration, monoclonal antibodies in certain tumors, as we know, Herceptin in breast cancer and Bevacizumab in, su in certain subpopulations of lung cancer may have a benefit. So again, reiterating that this is not just a T cell phenomenon, but B cells may have a role here through production of antibodies and an antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. Cancer vaccines, they work by generating an immunologic response uh, locally at this, that hopefully becomes a systemic response. And then nonspecific immunotherapies, which really is falling much more out of favor, although they may be boosts to other types of immunotherapy, such as interleukin um, in other cancers. So if we look at other large, multi-center, uh, highly invested uh, financially studies that have been done, why have they failed? So if you look at the START trial and the MADRIT trial, um, my impression is the reason why there is no benefit demonstrated in any of these tumors comes back to what I presented as one of the first slides. So in these particular tumors, they were using vaccinations. And so what they're doing basically in those studies is replacing box number one from the tumor generating the, or the tumor or other therapies generating the tumor antigens by giving a vaccine. So they gave the vaccine in, uh, and give the antigen, but then it still relied on two, steps two through seven in order to get the immune response and the benefit they were looking for, which, as I mentioned before, you can see there are lots of positive and negative regulators along the path that probably prevented those therapies from, be, from showing efficacy. So how can we make immunotherapy even more successful from where we are today? I think our understanding of this uh, interface between the tumor uh, and the immunologic system is incredibly basic and incredibly elementary, and I think we're going to have to get a much better understanding of not just the T cells, but uh, the, T, the B cells, the NK cells, the macrophages, the dendritic cells, and harness more of those other cells to enhance our immunotherapy uh, effectiveness. And I think what we will find, just as we are finding the molecular uh, environment for patients' tumors are unique, I think the immunologic environment for every patient's tumor is going to be unique. But not only that, is the immune environment for the tumor different based on where the tumor is? So the primary tumor immunologic environment differ from the nodal disease environment, and does that differ from the metastases? And do we need to understand that, and can we, if we understand that, can we alter the therapies we offer the patient that will uh, improve their outcomes? Does the immune environment change with the stage of the disease? So is, if, whether they're recurrent, whether they've had response and they're recurrent, you know, what is it about the tumor microenvironment that may change over that period of time uh, with various therapies that uh, we can harness and understand? And lastly, using our current conventional therapies, how, how does that change the tumor microenvironment? So does, is chemotherapy a bad thing for the immune system? By suppressing certain um, cellular subtypes, does that actually enhance the um, immunosuppressive environment? Does that uh, impair T cell function? So do we need to better understand what's going on with our conventional therapies? Radiation, maybe radiation is a good thing because radiation um, by creating necrosis and not so much impacting the general immunologic system can create new antigens. Um, and this is, some of you probably have heard of the RADVAX trial where you give radiation followed by immune inhibitors in the attempts of, I think that's very simple complex, uh, concept you generate new antigens, you generate new T cell activity, and then you enhance their activity by giving them PD-1 inhibition. So again, I think the, the major question, especially for me as a proceduralist who does a lot of the biopsies for, I think, most of uh, the people in the environment that are trying to make the therapeutic decisions, how is it and how can we best define the immunologic environment for these patients and use that information then so that we can create a precision immunotherapy um, going forward? And so I think this is where we all want to be. This is, I think, one of the earliest uh, publications showing PD-1 inhibition response. But I think the question is, and the other individuals are going to review the data in these studies, and it looks fantastic, but remember, it's still a minority of patients that are actually having this response, probably because, again, we just have a very early understanding of the immunologic environment and a very early understanding of how we can integrate these immune therapies into our conventional therapies and how we can maybe do combinatorial, which I think will also be discussed at some point, uh, combinatorial immune therapies in order to further enhance um, the immunotherapy responses we're seeing.
I think that's it. Thank you.